Natural Resources Division of Oil and Gas and its various precursor divisions have done an exemplary job of regulating the Ohio oil and gas industry and providing the oversight necessary for a successful program. As the industry, environmental awareness, and environmental legislation have changed over the years, the ODNR has adjusted its regulations accordingly. They have done this with the interests of the citizens and the environment at heart. I have no doubt that the ODNR will continue its fine work and the necessary adjustments to regulatory procedures as Ohio's oil and gas industry changes as it has all along. Finally, as Utica shale exploration and production expands in the state of Ohio, the state government must provide ODNR with the additional financial and human resources necessary to guarantee safe drilling, production, disposal, and protection to the environment that all Ohioans deserve and expect. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative O'Brien. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you for your testimony. The question I have is, as we stand right now, there's a moratorium on the well uh, that we're talking about, a five-mile moratorium. Correct. However, my district, which is close by, there is application and the possibility of two injection wells going in. My concern, and I'm sure the concern of some of uh, my constituents, is what is the distance and how long does this fault line go? How far would you put a moratorium from the, the Youngstown base well to into my district or other districts? It's very difficult to determine how far this fault would extend. And I think uh, both Mr. Stewart and Dr. Chase, or Mr. Stewart for sure, pointed out examples of why this is difficult. Um, the actual information that we have access to uh, does not well, let, let me back up. The technology that we have available to us, and we can look at seismic surveys, reflection surveys, 3D seismic surveys, whatever you want to use, the resolution of determining a fault, particularly a strike-slip fault, at 9,000 feet or 12,000 feet depth uh, is not very great. So you would need some sort, and what I mean by resolution, you would need some sort of a, a vertical offset uh, likely in excess of 30 feet. Now, I'm not an expert geophysicist, so I'm probably getting myself into a little bit of a dangerous area here, but you, I have worked with geophysical data, and there is a limit on the resolution. Just as a follow-up, is there a level or a depth that you would say is too deep to go that now we're getting into where a fault line could be? For instance, if we went down as deep as this is, the Youngstown one I understand is a very deep, deep well. Would you recommend then not going so far down uh, regulation saying going, say, limiting at 9,000 feet because that would then procure a uh, possibility of an earthquake. If, if all the rock layers and the basement itself were perfectly horizontal, you could set a depth limit. But since the rocks of Ohio dip towards the southeast, and what that means is as you travel to the southeast, things get progressively deeper, you can't set a depth limit. What you can do is look at the types of formations. And when you look at the granite basement rocks, which are known to have faults in them, we just don't know where they are. We know where some of them are, but there's obviously more of them. These rocks are fractured. That's the only type of porosity that they have. If fluids are to migrate into these rocks, they're going to follow those fractures. That's what's available to them and ultimately may intersect and start working into a fault. So even if the well doesn't penetrate a fault, you have the potential through migration through fractures, which are associated with faults. You cannot fault an igneous rock like granite without fracturing it as well. And so you leave open conduits for this fluid to travel. My thoughts on the issue would be not to complete wells into the Precambrian basement rocks. It's that simple. And just well, how, depth, how deep is that? The, the Here in Youngstown, it's about 9,000 feet. You get down near Marietta, you're looking at about 12,000 feet. So if, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, if we don't go that deep, then that 9,000 feet, that would be almost a limit. Anything above that would be satisfactory. Well, you can't – I want to repeat myself. You can't set a limit because the rocks aren't horizontal. If they're horizontal, understand. you can say 9,000 feet. What you need to do is identify the formations that are not acceptable and – I don't see any reason for injecting into Precambrian basement rocks. 
They're not good receptors of the fluids. They don't have good porosity or permeability. And so if you limit these wells that they do not drill into, or if you have to drill into it to provide a rat hole for doing the measurements on the Mount Simon sandstone that sits directly on top of it, then you need to plug that back, cement it back. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Representative Fetter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I like the fact that you're giving some recommendations uh, for us to consider and, and have other people um, take a look at and consider as well. Um, how many, are there any other states that take a look at this type of recommendation where they do go ahead and try to cement over any of these cold rat holes? Um, I'm not familiar with the regulations in, in other states. I know what we do here in Ohio. And in Ohio, in permitting a class two injection well, the geological information that's available that we have is looked at in the permitting process, just like it is in permitting a production well. But follow up, please. So your recommendation for this process is something that um, could be done? Absolutely. We, we have a pretty good idea where the Precambrian basement rocks lie. We have quite a few holes that have penetrated into it for various reasons. And CoCorp seismic data that was shot some time ago by federal government, that gives you enough basic resolution to determine the depth of it and the overall structure of the formation. It doesn't allow you to identify minor faults like the one that here in Youngstown seems to be. Follow-up, please. Um, who would then pick up the cost for doing that? Who would pick up the cost? I, I suppose that would depend on legislators and, and what type of things that uh, they work out. But uh, the cost, you mean, of doing a seismic survey or doing the evaluation of existing data? That and also who would be responsible for plugging up the red hole? Oh, that would be the company that's drilling the uh, production, or excuse me, the, uh, the injection well. Very good. Thank you. Representative Hagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, we're getting a lot of suggestions, and I think that uh, they're great. On the other hand, uh, what can we do to better solidify the information that where we're putting these injection wells are, in fact, um, safe places. For instance, we built the nuclear, uh, perinuclear power plant on a fault. You're aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now, we're, uh, now we're trying to make a decision legislatively whether we should prevent uh, going into the basement rock uh, or we should ban it. Would you suggest that we only go a certain amount, stay out of the basement rock, uh, and that we do a uh, uh, even further studies to determine where we're putting these injection wells. As I previously stated, I, if it were up to me, I wouldn't inject fluids via class two injection wells into the Precambrian basement rock. As far as solidifying the data and what can we do additionally, um, it's important to understand that not all faults are created equal. And these faults that the one that was imaged with the two earthquakes that occurred in December, it, uh, from the geophysical experts at uh, Lamont Doherty Labs, they came up with a, a minor left lateral fault. Um, I don't know of any technology that exists today that would allow us to identify that. And if we could run these sophisticated seismic surveys, uh, we would spend a lot of money, and I'm not sure that it would provide the information that we want. One of the things that geologists are constantly confronted with is making interpretations based on limited data. And when you're looking at, in this case, the Precambrian basement rocks that are great depth, 9,000 feet here in the Youngstown area, it's very difficult to know the character, particularly of faults that may exist within that rock, know the character and the location of those. And so unfortunately, when it comes to drilling these class two injection wells, you can't know based on with the information we have whether you would intercept a fault if you went into the Precambrian basement. And that's precisely why I recommend that we don't do it. If you need to complete in the Mount Simon, which is a good injection formation, the rat hole that's required to do that needs to be plugged back. Well, Mr. Chairman, with uh, Dr. 
what we're seeing then is that uh, DNL Energy and some of the other uh, companies as well are digging deeper, particularly so that they can inject more and take more. Uh, am I wrong to assume that then uh, at the 9,000 foot level, being in the Precambrian in the basement, that we really that we really are uh, toying with danger, and that if if as regulators or legislators with the power to regulate, should we not be looking at at least slowing that process down to look at it? Because now you have, in Marietta, you have one that's not as deep, and in Youngstown you have one at 9,000. So you have a substantial amount of differences that, that uh, are causing earthquakes, or in my opinion, they're causing earthquakes because they weren't there before. Uh, circumstantially, they were not there before, so they're causing it. Should we not then back off a little bit? Well, how do we, all due respect, how do we explain the occurrence of earthquakes that take place where there is no class two injection? Uh, well, uh, I mean that's that's a good scientific question, but yeah. I guess my it, point is is that class two injection does not necessarily cause earthquakes. Construction of the wells may have something to do with that, mm -hmm. and I'm not really all that familiar with the Marietta case. I have looked into it. And from what I can tell, the injection wells in the Marietta area are relatively shallow compared to the basement where these faults occur. And I think speculation that these earthquakes are triggered by injection is pure speculation with very little evidence to back it up. And as Dr. Chase pointed out, by having a seismograph installed at Marietta will help us determine if there is a connection or not. Now, as far as the injection fluids and pressures, the volumes, I'm not a reservoir engineer. And I, I would defer that question to Dr. Chase or to uh, uh, Mr. Stewart. I cannot answer that. Mr. Chairman, Doctor, I would just ask that question then. I mean, as, as a learned individual as yourself, uh, would we not want to err on the side of caution since you indicated that you're not sure, they've indicated they're not sure, but in fact, there are there are there is increased seismicity that would cause alarm. Should we not then just slow the process down and find out why, instead of just saying that uh, that you know it still could be, but it may not be? Let's let's not stop the uh, injection. Um, I believe that erring on the side of caution is not a bad idea, but. You also have to weigh into that equation what level of risk are you willing to accept by continuing on with the injection. If no risk is acceptable, then I don't know what the answer is. But it's quite obvious in our industrial society that we accept risk in everything that we do. Well, it would seem too, Doctor, that, uh, Mr. Chairman, Doctor, that uh, ODNR permitted uh, the injection well in the Precambrian rock, correct? And, yes. Uh, uh, it is risking more earthquakes if they're allowing it, under your theory, to inject more in the uh, basement rock. So should we not then say to ODNR, back off, slow down? Um, as I stated earlier, I would suggest to ODNR and in private conversations with people at ODNR, I have indicated that completing a well into the Precambrian basement rock is not a good idea. And if it, if it has to be done to provide the space necessary to make the measurements in the Mount Simon sandstone, then it needs to be cemented back. And, okay. and I think that's, that's a reasonable outlook on it. But okay. to take all Class II injection wells, many of them are very, very shallow. We have them as shallow as 400 feet. Um, the majority of them are in more like in the range of three to 5,000 feet. Do we, I don't think it would be um, wise to stop permitting those types of wells. One of the reasons why these wells are taking additional fluids, if indeed they are, I've heard it reported there, I don't know have anything to back that up with, is because there are more fluids coming into the state of Ohio. And a, a logical answer to the problem is the actual permitting of more class two injection wells so that we can handle the volumes that are coming this way. They would be way. closer to the water table and the aquifers, the, sh the shallow wells. Well, some of the very shallow ones up in uh, western Ohio, northwestern Ohio, um, yeah, it's kind of surprising how shallow they are, but they are, they are designed, they are constructed according to ODNR standards, and so there is protective casing that would be placed a minimum of 50 feet below and cemented back below the, the uh, deepest known 
water groundwater tower. source. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Senator Schiavone. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll be brief. I just wanted to follow up because those were the questions I had written down and some of them got answered. So the depth limit you don't think would help, but, but avoiding drilling into the basement rock you do think would be beneficial. Now the question that I didn't hear answered was can you figure out if you're drilling into Precambrian rock when you're drilling a well? Absolutely. Um, the sedimentary rocks here in Ohio, they're relatively hard. Um, nonetheless, drilling equipment doesn't have any problem penetrating them. But the whole time while you're drilling, you're monitoring your mud stream, uh, circulation mud, and you know precisely what you're drilling through. Plus, you can use drilling rates. And I'm quite confident that when you hit the Precambrian igneous metamorphic granite type rocks, you're going to see a substantial slowdown in your rate of drilling. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I don't think there's any question when you hit it. Because a lot of these things, a lot of these questions we ask, uh, the experts say, well, that's hard to find, that's hard to understand, that would be hard to pinpoint. But something like this seems, you know, science would, would say that drilling into this basement rock is problematic and you can figure out where that basement rock is, but you can't set a limit because it's, it differs throughout the state. Is that accurate? Absolutely. I cannot tell you that right underneath this podium we would hit the granite at 9,233 feet. It might be 8,900 feet. It might be 9,500 feet. You can't tell with that sort of accuracy. But in the drilling process, you certainly know when you hit it. Any uh, further questions to the witness? Okay. Representative Clyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to the witness. I just wanted to clarify one thing that you said in your testimony. You did a cursory review of all 180 uh, Class II injection wells and found only eight that have the open completion. The, the database actually contains about 260 wells in it. They're not, obviously not all operational. Uh, and in looking through that database, and, and you have to understand, uh, it's basically an Excel database. If you work with Excel, you know what I'm talking about. You can sort. You can look for different features in it. And I was sorting for depth, and I was sorting for completion formations. And based on that sorting and having a fairly limited time to work with, um, I came up with those wells, yes, And then with quick, open hole completions. A quick follow-up. I, I wasn't aware. Um, of that different type of, of uh, well completion. And I wonder if you could tell me how many other variations there are um, on the injection well completions. Again, you're starting to cross a little bit into the realm of petroleum engineering. But from looking at the records, it's obvious what an open hole completion is because the casing string, the production casing, which is one of typically three strings that are run in the well, it stops short of the bottom hole rather than extending all the way to the bottom hole through which then perforations are shot, as we talked about earlier with perforating for hydraulic fracturing. Uh, basically the same process that is done to perforate the casing to allow the fluids to migrate into the formations. In an open hole you have, depending on how much you have, I, the average is somewhere around 1,300 feet of those eight wells, you obviously have a number of these formations. That's an open hole. The other basic completion that I'm aware of, and there may be other ones I don't know, is where you perforate a particular interval or you can have multiple perforations and they're sealed off by a packer and then that uh, disposal fluid is limited to going into just those perforations, whether they be in one or more formations. Uh, that can certainly be the case, I believe. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dirk. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Um, I, I've got uh, th about three questions here. One of them uh, is has to do with the depth of the, the well we've all been referring to, which was the uh, 9,100 feet or so mm -hmm. in depth with an open completion of another 900 feet, taking it down to about 10,000 feet is, is Am I, am I kind of reading that right? Um, I might have uh, not been clear in the information as I was presenting it. The bottom of the well is at about 9,200 feet. That's the maximum depth of the well. 
Okay. There's and that's 204 feet into the Precambrian rocks. Right. If you go from the bottom of the hole in the Precambrian rocks up to where the bottom of the production casing is set, that's the you have a 977 foot open completion. Okay. Uh, to follow that up, uh, then you indicated that the uh, uh, December 4 and the December 31 uh, incidents. Uh, had hypocenters at 11.6 and 12,000 feet, a half a mile further down? Yes. Than the, than the bottom, well, a little more than that. Yes. Than the bottom of the, the drilling. Okay. Um, it is, my question is, is that a result of the pressure that the injection is pushed under to have been able to push it down a half a mile below what the bottom of the the drilling uh, site was? Or is that some sort of natural migration that can occur uh, in uh, this type of injection process? In answering that question, it's important to realize that having the hypocenter for these earthquakes at roughly half a mile below the bottom of this well um, does lend some suspect as to whether this well is triggering the earthquakes or not. All right? Um, however, if you buy into the notion that this well is triggering those earthquakes, it could be facilitated by fluids moving through. The well doesn't have to intercept the fault. Uh, it can intercept fractures within the Precambrian basement of which it has 204 feet of borehole to do it, so it's likely it has intercepted a fracture or two. And those fractures, fractures are often, fractures are associated with faults, all right? Um, excuse me, I said that backwards. <laughs> if you have a fault, you will get fracturing with it. Uh, fractures can be created by other means. But if there is indeed, what well, we do indeed have evidence for a fault, the way that this well could facilitate Fluid moving to it would be through fracture systems that lead down to where that fault has occurred. Um, follow, Chair. Yes, sir. Um, moving, moving, kind of uh, to its conclusion. If I if if I don't have this, um, I call this a slip. If I don't have this slip in in uh, uh, New Year's Eve, uh, the slip is a result of pressure buildup being released. If that pressure buildup isn't released at that time, it's going to be released at some future time because that exists independent of whether or not I have a borehole down there anyway. Absolutely. And if I don't have, aren't I getting gradual releases on what the pressure buildup is and lessening the intensity of any future earthquake? That is a topic of conversation. And if you have triggered an earthquake, you have released stress that had built up along that fault. So we can't say if, or we can say yeah, if it's going to happen someday, we just can't say when. It might be many, many generations down the road before it naturally could have, you know, released itself. But yes, you have released built up pressure along a fault system or along a fault plane. Uh, lastly, Chair, um, uh, and, and I guess maybe this was Dr. Chase that said this, that the, the horizontal drillers are exceeding what the current uh, safety standards are uh, for, for drilling. Uh, and I guess, un unfortunately, I didn't think of it then. <laughs> You're standing there now, and if he wants to jump back up, I don't think the Chair will object. Should we, and since they are exceeding what the, the minimum requirements are for safety in the horizontal uh, drilling now, should we move, should DNR move their um, regulations to match the current safety that our drillers are, are, are performing to? Should, should we, they're the ones that are moving the goalposts, should we move our regulations to where they're moving the goalposts? If it's okay with Chairman Hall, I would defer the answer of that question to Dr. Chase. Chairman? If he's willing.
I would say no. Okay. I would say if the standards are fine and people are willing to exceed it on behalf of doing things the right way, I think I think we should just be grateful. I think if we see that the standards we've set don't hold up because people meet them and then we have failures, then we should change it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions to the doctor? Seeing none, uh, thank you for your uh, testimony. And again, thank you for uh, allowing us to be here. Thank this you. time, uh, I'm going to uh, I see uh, that we are finished with our witnesses. I want to thank the witnesses for uh, the time and your patience, and thank the uh, senators and representatives. And I appreciate the uh, the call reaching out to uh, many of you. Reached out to me during the, the process, and and, uh, okay. and we'll keep on reaching out to me. And again, uh, I am going to close the hearing and, and thank you for your time. And again, thank Youngstown State University for uh, the opportunity to be here.